Hello, everybody, and welcome to Music Career Radio. I'm your host, Nani Noam Vazana, and it's been a while. Uh, I took a beat from doing this podcast since COVID, but after meeting Tom Bassford at Budapest Street Mall last April, we found that we have way too much in common to let an opportunity go, and I decided to do another episode. So Tom is from Manchester, the UK. He runs English Folk Expo, which champions the folk roots and acoustic music sector in England. They deliver showcases, live events. Um, they offer artist mentoring, industry training, and even audience development. Their flagship event is the Manchester Folk Festival. And Tom also hosts online learning platforms and, and produces the UK official folk albums charts. Um, Tom is a member of the European Music Business Task Force, which I'm going to find out about because I must confess that I don't know a lot about and I want to hear more. Uh, he is also on the Greater Manchester Music Commission and on the steering group of Manchester Music City. Uh, he's also an elected politician. We'll find out a little bit about you know, the correlation between the forces that move music and politics and perhaps some methods that could help us do both. But before we dive in, I'd like to remind you that all the work on this podcast is done voluntarily, and this is why we are happy to receive your donations. So please visit ydiymusic.com slash donate and contribute any amount. It's as little as one euro is great. 100 is also great. Doesn't matter. Whatever you can is fine. Uh, you could also send a direct PayPal transfer to paypal.me slash Noam Vazana. Welcome, Tom. And how are you? And let me put you on the air. Hey, hey. Hi. Hi, Nani. How are you? Nice to see you again. Very good. Nice to see you. How have you been? Absolutely amazing and having a lovely time as always. Nice. I mean, in the music business, it's uh, there's never a boring day, I think. No. No, but that's that's what's really lovely about it. I mean, we've been at the moment we're putting the final touches to our festival program uh, for for October, and that's been a really exciting time. You know, announcing to the world all the amazing artists that are going to come and play in Manchester this time round. So um, yeah, that's been a, lo a lovely thing to to be doing at the moment. Nice. It's really exciting, and it's coming up October, isn't it? Right. Yeah, nineteenth to twenty-first yeah. of October in uh, in the northern quarter. So all new venues, different bit of the city. Um, it's it's quite it's exciting. It's a little bit nerve wracking, but uh, we're all really looking forward to it. Nice. Um, best way to describe you, in my opinion, is a ball of energy, because <laughs> 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 you're always up for hard work, and you do it in a positive spin. Um, I think it's very important for artists and generally for music professionals because the cultural sector is kind of what I call an ideological job. So where do you get all this energy from? I'm sure that our viewers would like to know. Oh my goodness, what a, what a question. Um, <laughs> well, well, look, I, I've always been kept really busy, but I've always believed that if you do what you love, then that will keep you motivated. That will keep you, um, that will keep you in uh keep you active and keep you engaged and i have always loved uh folk roots and acoustic music i've always loved working in the music industry and i've always loved helping people or enabling new opportunities to happen and and those things i suppose uh keep me going nice um and do you have any tips for musicians who struggle to keep their energy yes yeah. well look i, I you know, I work a lot with with musicians, uh, and that's one of the hardest things to do because you can feel uh, really isolated. It's quite a lonely thing to do um, at times, and also it's quite a an exposing thing to do where you are writing something, you're putting your you're putting your uh, your essence on or, or out there for people to value. Essentially, you know, you're putting your very cultural heart out there and saying, "Please support this," and that that can be quite a challenging thing to keep your motivation up and to keep a plan going. Uh, my advice on this kind of thing has always been to, to structure a plan, to have uh, a series of steps of where you know where you want to get to, to know what success looks like, and to, to make sure that you are following a, a trajectory that's something that you're happy and that you've agreed, as opposed to just getting up each morning and thinking, oh, what do I do? What do I do today? It's 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 no different. Well, it is different 
but it shouldn't feel different to if you're working in an, any other business where you, you've got goals, you've got tasks to achieve, you've got, um, uh, you've got a direction of travel. Uh, and, but the difference is that as a musician, you're making those things yourself. And, and that's quite a difficult thing to, to keep motivation up. But, you know, that's yeah. the important things of networks and knowing people and relying on your peers and friends and family to keep yourself on track. Yeah, and to show you that you are on the right way. I think yeah. imagining what success is, is probably the, the most difficult part because people think, oh, we want to be like this and that artist, but we don't really know what the building blocks of that path might be mm -hmm. and what actually makes us happy because a lot of people would say, yeah, I want to have the same career as Bjork, but I mean, like what happens if you have stage fright? What happens if you're not doing well on the road? Uh, what happens if you if you need a huge group of musicians to actually play your music, but it's only viable to tour solo at the time? So like all these things come down to killing your darlings, I guess. Uh, you got to set your priorities straight and find out a way that is really suitable for you, that you'll feel whole and OK with. And that will also propel you forward at the same time. I, I think it's one of those things that we, I suspect, will agree with each other a lot of the time on uh around this but because it's such an isolating thing yeah. the people who i've known who built the most the most successful sustainable careers that doesn't mean playing to the largest audiences it means having a really great career where they can have a good work-life balance where yes. they can earn enough money to live comfortably those musicians who achieve those things almost always have a few um a few consistent traits one of them is exactly uh, nanny as you teach a lot having a really good understanding of the music industry what the business looks like and how they're going to map their their journey through that but also um knowing uh, how to manage their own mental health uh well-being their resilience in that area because it is quite an isolating process and if you uh, you know you've really got to look after your your, your mental health or at least understand how to listen to what you need to do and when you need to take a time out. And then the third thing I always think with a lot of that is um, is that you kind of really need to, to, to lean into those networks and to treat this like it's, um, uh, uh, yeah, to treat this like you are the chief executive of your own business and you've got to learn exactly. about the career and you've got to learn about the industry in the same way that any other small business owner would do. Yeah, it's like we both have these online platforms that we teach musicians assets about the music industry. And one of the first um, episodes on my course is be your own CEO. There this you is go. The thing. Yeah, this is like a skill that you really got to learn uh, wh which decisions to make and when, what is viable, what is not, how to hire your band members, um, how to think forward, how to budget, you know, like mm. if I, I'm completely going off topic here but like um when i plan my budget i never plan a year ahead i plan five years ahead exactly exactly yeah. uh, I, I mean i yeah I, I would talk about this a lot with with various musicians that i work with but you know you can do a lot worse than than getting a, a, a bit of paper up or a calendar or a spreadsheet and looking yeah. several years ahead and saying okay well i'm going to release if i want to have an album out by this time track backwards to when right back to when am i yeah. going to start writing the music for that and then and then this, and then you've got a map over that your live touring programs you've got a map over that any other work that you need to do to make your music career viable and and if you and that plan will take several years to build up to cultivate those audiences i mean i should say we have totally not mentioned also you've got to be an excellent musician that you, you know that, <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's kind also of a really important bit but it's not a given but that's a really yeah. important bit but it's not just enough to be a really amazing musician sadly anymore maybe 10 20 years ago being an yeah. amazing musician might have been enough to get you over that line into into being a having a thriving career but those other two and that's because there were more um ways to make money yeah. back then for so other people who are not the artists like people would join in a team up with an artist because they felt like they could make money from their career. That's why people would get agents and managers and labels. And now, 
I mean, like I sell CDs myself, but they're mostly not sold in stores anymore. They're sold in, on tour. So why would the label come and be behind an artist that can't sell anything in the stores? Because they they make from they make money from distribution. Yeah, I, I mean, I think yeah, I totally agree with you in that instance. But I would also add a whole other challenge to this, which is that it's easier than ever to make and record high quality That's music content at home yourself. You don't, yeah. you know, 20 years ago, you had to go into a studio pretty much or or you had to invest some money in order to get this off the ground. But now there are more musicians than ever, you know, out there doing brilliant stuff, which means that the market is necessarily more competitive. And, and that means your entrepreneurial skill as a business leader yeah. has to play a greater role. Yeah, a great, great role. Yeah. Um, I moved out of my home country and came to Europe because I was following my music and I, I felt that I would have more success here. So I came to study in the Netherlands and then I stayed. Um, you chose to stay in the UK. You are from there and you, and you, and you still work there now. Uh, what made you make this choice? I, um, I love the fact that, that it's phrased as a, 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 that you phrase it as a choice because one of the challenges uh, in the UK more generally is that we is that many people I speak to don't it's not ever even occurred to them to move away whereas the way you've described it is that obviously I would move away to wherever I can get the best opportunities now that is a challenge for the for much of the UK even outside of the music industry mm -hmm. so I suppose to answer very practically your question it didn't even occur to me that I should have to uh feel the need to move away but that said um the uk market is massive you know for many people that i speak to especially across europe it's not possible to build a broad enough audience base without crossing international borders in the uk the, it, it is just about possible to build your music career without needing to go elsewhere in fact one of the things we talk about on the Greater Manchester Music Commission most is how we retain music business, music industry talent, including musicians, in our northwest region rather than the brain drain to London, uh, so it's called. Um, and that's one of the challenges. Now, on a on a slightly larger scale, that's what you've described, isn't it? Having to to move to a different country to be where the opportunities are. Yeah. Well, I'm a great believer in egalitarianism, in fairness, in sharing those opportunities. And that means that in Greater Manchester, it's our responsibility to build the infrastructure of a music industry that can retain people so that you don't, haven't got to be faced with the choice of leaving your family, leaving your hometown. If you want to build a career in any particular industry, I believe you should be able to have the opportunity to do that from wherever you feel most comfortable. That would have been amazing. I mean, if I could build my career where I come from, I would probably have stayed. Yeah. But I know that a lot of people are moving to the UK because they think and they feel that there is more opportunity for them there, especially if they play English text music. Mm. Like if, if the lyrics are sung in English, then they think, okay, I have to move to an English speaking country. However, I mean, in Europe, there's hardly anybody who speak, who never speaks English anymore. So I don't know. It doesn't, yeah. maybe it doesn't matter where you live. It's more about what are you willing to invest? But I do see from the programmer's point of view that they like when they know that I'm from Israel and then they would ask me, do you live there? Because it's going to cost me money to fly you in and it's going to cost me money to arrange for your artist visa. But when they hear that I'm from Europe, they're like, oh, that's easy. You can just mm. come by train. Uh, and I think, you know, I think that's exactly a key point, isn't it? You've got to make it as easy as possible for someone to work with you yeah. in the industry. And one of the challenges facing many UK artists at the moment in this uh, post-Brexit landscape is that a lot of the confidence from European uh, festival bookers in, in particular and venue bookers and promoters have been an uncertainty about, oh, do I now need to jump through certain visa hoops or have I got some issues around carnets or you know I can't yeah. if you're given the choice of booking a UK artist and booking an EU member resident 
I have noticed uh, that, that it's people have taken the opportunity to go with what they know, which is working within the EU. Part of my role, even though I abhor Brexit with a wild and burning passion, part of my role is to try and break down those barriers to solve some of those myths and challenges and to say, don't discount us. Like we are still, the UK is still a very vibrant market and is absolutely possible for uh, European uh, resident musicians to tour in the UK. And it's absolutely possible for UK artists to tour into Europe. And the barriers should not be something that is impossible to overcome, especially yeah. at a grassroots or independent or early career stage. It gets a bit more challenging if you're touring with you know trucks and full production and stuff like that that does have some more concerns but if you are an artist who hops in a van then you probably still can have well you definitely still can have a vibrant uh, touring career in the into the uk and uk artists into europe yeah i mean generally if you tour if you're able to tour solo and maybe add source for some musicians in the host country or even do an entirely solo thing on your own or maybe diminish the size of your band. I, I see it like especially new with, uh, now with the new jazz projects that are popping up, you see like the orchestra feel is like very strong. People call themselves that kind like, I don't know, the, the Joan Russell Orchestra or the Mia Piero uh, uh, authentic light experience. So I mean like that's great, but how do you tour with 12 people? It's very, very hard. So what it usually happens with these type of projects is that they operate on a year because they received a grant and then the next year they have to do something else. Mm. So um, I, I have a lot of luck, maybe, well, I don't know if it's luck, it's more of a decision uh, because I started touring solo back in 2004, 2005, I don't know, something like that. And I've done like six years, only, only solo shows around Europe. Mm. So I've got the skill of being, you know, being able to adjust. Mm. I played with a lot of musicians that also on the road. So like now when I go to a host country, I hardly ever take my own band anymore. I usually like a couple months in advance contact with local musicians and say, hey, shall we play together? But you've said that's, that's look, it's not. It's a strategic decision that you've taken and you've put yourself in the position where opportunity can happen. That's, yes. that's exactly how you build a, 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 your music business. Yeah, outsource and resource. Yeah, well, you think pragmatically, you understand the consequences, but uh, financially and creatively of the actions that you want to take. And you've mitigated that to ensure that your touring opportunities are viable uh, and sustainable. Like that, that's, that's the step, isn't it? Yeah, you gotta do it. Otherwise, I mean, you will vanish at some point because when you stay rigid, you die out. It's like being a dinosaur, you know, evolution happens and you can't, you can't hold on to your old ways because you don't adapt. And when you don't adapt, you disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly that. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the world sees the UK as, I mean, of course, in Ireland and Scotland as well as the number one folk music export country in general. Uh, but when looking at the folk, uh, music scene is doing in the UK right now, I'd say that it has a sub, 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 surprisingly <laughs> low traction. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's about, a lot of it is about brand identity and a lot of it is about what people's perceptions of folk are and where mm -hmm. that, where that, that genre line sits. Interestingly, one of the motivations for creating English Folk Expo uh, 10 or more years ago now was that people understand Celtic music. They understand the nature of, you know, what does it mean to have Scottish or Irish or potentially uh, Welsh, uh, but that also extends to Breton uh, and, and those kind of Celtic regions. There were many uh, opportunities for people who sat within that Celtic genre um, in Europe and in the US and in Canada. However, there was there's this absolutely massive uh, group of artists based in the UK, largely in England, who don't identify with that Celtic genre label. They're playing English folk music. Now, that wasn't necessarily something that had a large international market recognition. It doesn't have a strong brand outside of 
England. And one of the challenges we've been trying to tackle over the years has been to open those market opportunities. Now, we don't have a, 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 an easy, a, a brand identity that is as easily graspable or understandable as Celtic. So we've been trying to promote individual artist opportunities from England yeah. overseas. Uh, and that's been, it, 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 takes, it, it takes time, but it has been possible. And we are now starting to see uh, uh, you know, decent numbers of English folk musicians uh, building their international networks and careers, but it's it's a it's a long journey, and there's still a long way to go yeah. on that. Yeah, I mean, generally, what what is folk about? I just showcased at Folk Alliance in the UK, and I was the only artist in the program that was not Americana or English. Let's say the the, the big UK based English, Celtic, Scottish uh, folk tradition. Even there was even a band that was performing that came from Finland was catering to these traditions. So I was kind of surprised. I mean, like, usually they would put me into the world music scene and the, and the diversity rubric, if you will. Uh, but like this time I was chosen to showcase on a very big folk festival. Um, so I was wondering where does that definition come from and what exactly do they define as folk? And uh, how can we, I mean, folk is folklore, right? It's coming from traditions. Uh, so knows? it shouldn't be anything. Oh, Nanny, we've, I, we, I think we've only got like an hour. Like I could talk, <laughs> about, I could talk about this all day. Ironically, of yeah. someone that works, uh, uh, that, that runs an organization called English Folk Expo, I've got a real problem with genre labels. I think they are yeah. restrictive. I think they try and artificially pigeonhole artists into certain areas and artists grow and change and move around with the music that they produce. And once you've been given that label, then for some artists, that might be where you're pitched for a long time and it's very difficult to work your way out of that. Yeah. We say folk roots and acoustic music. What is that? I mean, I really have no idea um, how to define it. And I, and, um, I'm kind of, we come across this every month with the official folk albums charts that every month somebody will say, is this folk or or does this need to go in the indie chart or does this yeah. go in the kind of global music charts or whatever or where do you draw the line there? And yeah. I haven't got a hard and fast uh, concrete answer to these things. I suppose if you want to join the folk, uh, the folk club, if you want to join the folk scene, then then in you come you know like it yeah. i've always i've always felt if you identify yourself as with the genre then you are absolutely welcome uh and uh within it and equally for those artists who are moving through genres i mean as you do you brush the uh, uh, jazz and that term world music i don't even know if i if i like that term if i like that term anymore i often call it global sounds uh what does that even mean you know, I think it's wrong to to stick a pin in someone and say, "That's you. You're a roots artist. You're a folk artist." Um, I think it's kind of a, a term that the industry find helpful to categorize or to box off certain things or to, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm really excited about uh, my great friends at Cambridge Folk Festival this year, um, uh, who have got an incredible, exciting, diverse lineup. And I'm convinced that 20 years ago, their audiences would have said, well, that's not folk and that's not folk, but they put it on, yeah. so therefore it's folk. Yeah, at the beginning of my career, I was doing like a mix, like you said, of a lot of different musical genres. And they're like, yeah, what the hell is this? We can't book you. It's not pop, it's not jazz, it's not indie, it's not world, what is it? So I don't have the right contacts for you. And now, like when I apply to a music festival, I very often get, um, like a reply says, oh, you also do crossover. <laughs> That's like, what do you mean? You also do crossover. Yeah. We started it. We, my generation is the generation that started crossover music. Uh, so like it, it was just maybe a little bit before its time, 20 years mm -hmm. ago. But I mean, what, what, what other music isn't crossover music? Do you, do you think the Beatles is not crossover music? Well, I mean, I mean 
yeah this one didn't, didn't, didn't uh was it louis armstrong that said all music is folk music because i've never exactly. heard a horse play a banjo i think that was his quote like like oh i don't think there's a I th yeah who who knows i think is the uh is the answer for that one and and probably uh, yeah tell me more about the folk uh, charts because that was your initiative to try and promote local artists how, how did you come up with that how what what do you see the results now and like in real well, time yeah it was um we created and we launched the folk charts during the height of the lockdown so um what i recognized as soon as we went in to stop having the live music industry stop is that it was very difficult to get traction for artists in uh, the folk scene ish whatever that is um it was very difficult for them to get their new releases heard and championed and the bbc did used to run um the folk awards which was a moment when uh you know the media's attention could turn to this bit of the music industry and then artists can do things like i was nominated for a folk award or i was nominated for the folk singer of the year and it becomes a marketing uh thing for how they pitch their gigs and how they try and build their their careers externally and when those folk awards stopped um and the pandemic hit we decided that we needed something to to recognize uh the amazing albums that are being created within this genre that, to recognize um the the breadth of the uh the uk folk scene so we worked with the official charts company who do all of the uk formal charts and um created this genre chart unbelievably there wasn't a folk chart there was a singer songwriter an irish um an afrobeat a punjabi music chart there was no folk chart and so we worked with them came up with various algorithms went back and forward on the streaming uh, uh on the um the, the the rules for for which albums count as folk and whether you can do compilations and all that kind of stuff and then launched this chart in october 2020 and it's a sales chart so it's based on streams and downloads and physical sales through registered retailers um and it's it, it's been a really fantastic way for artists who are re releasing music in this genre to say hey i'm a top 40 artist this month or i'm a top 20 right. artist or or however and because of the the algorithms that we put on the platform uh for the selection it's absolutely possible for every single diy musician who is releasing albums in the UK um, for folk to to chart as long as you. But what does it mean to release an album in the UK besides streaming? Do you mean like a physical distributor? Yeah, well, I think I need to look at the rules which are on our website, EnglishFolkExpo.com. But um, I think you've got to have at least one band member who is who is uh, a UK national or i think it's a uk yeah. and irish national i think that's what it is okay. at least one member so that way we're not um and then it and then it charts it, it tracks sales streams and downloads in the uk yeah in the uk that's right cool. and um and not and, worldwide but specifically to the uk yeah that's right that's right uh so it's it's quite a narrow scope uh with it but that means that well, what it does mean is, you know, Bob Dylan releases an album that won't appear in the UK folk albums charts. And so it helps to narrow that market field a little bit. But what it does mean is that every month um, certain radio shows talk about the new entries. We've got there's a brilliant podcast uh, run by the team at Folk on Foot who give a monthly chart rundown, which I'm, I'm delighted that they do that. And they do interviews with people releasing music. It's a great way. I discover new artists every month yeah, by looking at that chart and seeing people appear in it yeah. that I didn't know. And I also discover artists that I love have released albums that I'd maybe just missed because I'm not getting the Facebook notifications or whatever. Uh, yeah. So it's a brilliant way to say, here, my album's here. And what that often means is that people mm -hmm. who appear in the charts one month might climb the next month as people are using the charts to discover the new music that they're releasing and and that's been a really helpful helpful thing and it also means that artists can say look i'm going on tour with my top 10 album which uh which really helps them when speaking to promoters and venues and and festivals about getting those gigs 
So it has been quite a quite a, a, an interesting thing. It's also meant that artists have had to lean into the industry side more. It's been easy, or not easy, but in the folk world, it's kind of relatively safe to say, okay, I'll just deal with this bit. I'm not part of the big, bad music mm. industry world, or however you might perceive that. that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So by having these charts, it has meant that um, musicians have to understand how to register their music. They have to understand what Kantar uh, does as the chart reporting uh, company. It has to, uh, uh, it, they have to understand about when they are releasing their music, whether they use what registered uh, retailers do, how to make sure that they are properly tagging all their music, how to make sure that they are listing their licenses and all the kind of various things that you need to do in any bit of the music industry. This has been a kick, a, a kickstart for those uh, emerging artists, those DIY artists who maybe just haven't done the whole, this is how you register your music. This is what it means yeah. to release an album from a, a, a licensing point of view and a legal point of view. So that's been quite a helpful thing because it's enabled people to, to learn about that. It's also highlighted issues where there are slight injustices in the music industry. And so mm -hmm. I was able to campaign on some of those things and to really um, to really try and voice the, the opinions of artists that we were getting fed back to us. One very small example was that many independent artists use Bandcamp, uh, yeah. uh, folk artists use, use Bandcamp especially. And for a time, uh, there was a challenge between the official charts company, Kantar, who are the marketing research agency that map it, and Bandcamp for registering Bandcamp downloads um, for chart sales. Mm -hmm. And actually, we were able to work really closely with the teams in all those areas uh, to make sure that that, that, was res that was resolved. And I'm really pleased that it has been resolved and that downloads mm -hmm. now attract but you know the those are the kind of thing you know those campaign issues are things that we really want to pick up on i think so so yeah it's um yeah. it's quite an exciting thing for us to be to be involved in and has opened up uh some parts of the commercial music industry uh in a more visible way to people who are sitting in a quite a specialist genre yeah i mean i guess for me it's not really a thing because of most of my sales are in the shows or on my own website because mm -hmm. I actually don't release my full albums to the streaming services. And not on, I mean, like I used to release them on Bandcamp as well, but I think the last album I released there was 2014. So yeah, it's been a while since I've been in touch with the big major uh, networks. I do have digi um, uh, physical distributors. One of them is in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, like I see that I earn more revenue when I directly sell to my fans at concerts and via my mailing list or my website. And whether yeah, if I would yeah. have done that on the streaming services, um, I wouldn't get as much. Yeah. I think I think yeah. that's a, a, something we could debate a lot about the rights and wrongs of that, because you're exactly right. You retain more of the pie if you sell everything yourself uh, and you go through all of your own um, you go through all of your own platforms to sell. You're exactly right. You would retain all of that. But the argument on the other side of that is that by working, by giving a share of that pie out to other people, then is there, a, it, does it, does the whole thing become bigger? Does everyone do better? Does everyone make those returns? Now, for some people, the answer will be yes. And for some people, the answer will be no. Yes, but it's important it to understand. The music you release. Yeah, exactly. In relationship uh, with your fan base. Yes exactly your relationship with your fan base and um you know i i do often recommend that artists put their music on all the streaming platforms if you're especially if you're trying to grow your fan base because yes. you because your music has to be accessible to as many people as possible if you're trying to reach out if you already have a strong fan base and one that is keeping you know that's really viable and you don't feel that you need to be be hand, you feel like the balance has tipped the other way that you're making just enough money thank you very much off your album sales with your direct fan base then maybe you don't need to go down that route of handing over a chunk of it uh, it's about understanding it's how that works not a chunk of it it's all of it 
Yes, that's well, something yeah. that you need to maybe refer to. Because, like for instance, a Spotify stream would pay the artist zero point zero 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 three percent cent. Sorry, um, euro cent, and from that earnings, uh, they also take about eighty percent to themselves. You don't get so like you would get twenty percent out of zero point zero 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 three cent. Which is very little. Like, the, I have two full albums on Spotify, mm -hmm. and I think seven singles or eight singles um, since 2012 or 11. Um, that like they've been accumulating streams, hundreds and thousands of streams, and throughout the whole era of being on streaming services, I got about 180 dollars. Um, and I absolutely, I absolutely hate being yeah. in the position of trying to defend yeah. this because I don't because I think it is indefensible, and I absolutely align and support what you've said. My yeah. my comeback to that though is um, uh, is that would those millions of people who have now listened to your music and might have heard your name and seen what you're doing, how many of them have chosen not to buy? your album most, most of them. well that's the question and that's the balance is that is that the argument goes uh, but the, the and i'm not going to justify there. it i'm not going to justify it but no, no, I i'm think... saying the plays are there i've yeah. already had hundred thousands of streams yeah and but they, but, i don't but, have hundred thousands of sales but have and people would come to me after the concert and would say mm -hmm. like hey are you in spotify oh great i'm gonna listen there oh, yeah, and okay. for about five years six years mm -hmm. i didn't sell any cds anymore yeah and then when I cut off the streaming, I all of a sudden started selling 1,500 1, CDs per year. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dispute or argue too vociferously on this because I it's different for every single musician. One example about it's not directly into streaming, but it is the case. Um, you can um, so chart reporting sales uh, in for the UK in any chart doesn't. Yeah deal doesn't pick up live sales so most musicians sell most of their cds at live gigs and yeah. it's the same for everyone everyone's in the same boat but what you can do is pay uh some money to the official charts company which i don't i think i think the, the payment structure they set up is it could be fairer um and then you can record your online you can record your live sales to make it uh to make it register for the charts now in those scenarios an artist has had to make the decision what is of greater value yep. me placing high in the charts or me retaining more of my live sales and that's yep. a balance that i think is 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 for a, an artist to make and i don't think there should be judgment either way on that i think mm -hmm. similarly going back to streaming i do think an artist has the option to say i would rather that my music reached was was more accessible and re or maybe some of my music not all uh, was exactly. a that's the piece. That's why I said it. Yeah, there yeah. you go. So, yeah. but I don't. I think I think that every artist might make a decision that is different to another artist. Yes. What's uh, What's important is that the fundamental decision making framework behind that decision is consistent. So yes. that's why it's important to have a plan. That's why it's important to have a strategy. If you are in your I'm building an audience as fast as I can phase, then you might. You, that then the balance might be I'm going to put it on every single streaming platform I possibly can and that's the route that I'm going to go if you yeah. are in a different phase of your career you might make a different choice but again that you know if an yeah. art if I look for an artist's music and I can't find it easily then I'm not then that probably impacts their chances of uh of of being selected on on a pro on a program well it's probably different for us because we do go out of our way to find those things but for a lot of those programmers mm -hmm. and for a lot of those decision makers they are making decisions very quickly about a lot of music and if i'm doing an open call and someone puts a link to a soundcloud because they might not have a link to spotify and that soundcloud link is expired or private mm -hmm. Then I'm not going to write back to the artist and say, "Oh, this link is broken. Can you send me the yes. right one?" That artist just goes in the no pile. So there are those swings and roundabouts, and sure. I don't, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way uh, that is blanket correct for every artist. But I do think you've got to 
go into this decision making framework knowing the ramifications of what you are deciding to do yes there is always a and uh, something to be learned from each decision and then also priorities and advantages that, or disadvantages that have mm -hmm. to be taken into account yeah that's correct Spot on. yeah well um, we, we, we rambled there we deviated <laughs> That we're good with in rambling, you know. Okay. Uh, we've proved that in Budapest right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we both like karaoke, also. Oh my I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah here's, here's a secret you didn't know, um, Tom. You're also an elected politician. Mm. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you recognize any skills that could be comparable between politics and the music industry in general like is there anything that you've learned from one side that helped you on the other side and vice versa yeah i mean there's probably some of the obvious things communication is absolutely key if you can't articulate uh so, uh, a, a thing very well as i'm just struggling to to articulate it now yeah whether that is a policy platform or whether it's a description of why your music is unique and should be engaged with then you've got a, then that's a challenge. Being able to succinctly and clearly describe why someone should pay you attention exactly crosses over and maps. Mm -hmm. I also think that having patience and a strategy are important both in the music industry and in politics, because sometimes things take an inordinately long period of time, longer than you expect or want them to. And so, having having mapped out those steps is a challenge yeah. i also think um i mean on the most basic bluntest sense they're both popularity contests if the the people <laughs> that i represent don't prefer someone else to me mm -hmm. then i'm on i'm on the road uh, whereas uh, you know in, in music is i guess we don't like to think of it like this but it is if you're yeah. making music that people aren't enjoying then people aren't going to pay you for your music um or, or that doesn't yeah. chime with them in some in some way those are the kind of things that are similar there are other bits of crossover though like ultimately there are injustices and challenges that that are restricting musicians and their teams from building their careers and those challenges some of them can only be solved through politics so whether that is the very practical issues around brexit and touring that we've already touched on or whether that is about infrastructure for rehearsal studios or whether that is um, appropriate funding points so that people can take that first step and take that risk you know if you're making the, the jump from working full-time in uh, in uh, just a regular office job and you want to be a musician then at some point you've got to take quite a risk you've got to take quite a jump and for a lot of those musicians and people setting up music businesses, um, you need some form of financial safety net. And often that mm -hmm. comes from the state. Uh, and so having someone in a, having a political uh, focus on that does make a big difference. Setting that music strategy, setting that, that um, regional export uh, pri series of priorities, those are important things that, that where politicians do influence music industry and vice versa. Yeah, so it gives you like a breadth of knowledge and maybe kind of an overview of the path before you start taking it. Maybe you also relate to others because it's not only about you, you're, you're creating within a network of other decision makers um, yeah. that helps you assimilate into a community. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes they're just injustices. You know, the whole fixed music streaming uh, uh, campaign ultimately will resolve itself in political intervention. And so if you care passionately about something, if you are of a campaigning mindset, then you end up in politics because that is where the, that's where the roots to change are really felt. Yeah, I mean, music is an ideological job. So exactly. I mean, exactly. Especially folk music. I mean, folk music, the music of protest, the music of people, the music of, um, you know, these songs are about some of the oldest songs that I know are about injustices uh, yes. that happen. Uh, you know, they're a way to communicate p 
political ideas. They're a way to communicate ideology. They're a way to give warnings to if you allow people to do these things, then these are the consequences. You know, folk music especially is inherently political. And if you are, um, if you are as committed and as tied up with folk music as I am, a, a political step is a natural is a natural move. Yeah, very clear. Um, we met at a conference in in Budapest in Hungary. Um, I go to a lot of conferences, music industry events, trade fairs, showcase events, you name it. Um, and I think it really approved. Uh, approved and improved my presence in the community uh, because you get to know people in fr firsthand, you get to have conversations, people don't look at you anymore as the musician who is trying to infiltrate the group, They're, they see you as one of them. Um, I think from the moment I started visiting trade fair events, I learned more about myself and also about the industry, like how can I make people understand that I want to be a part of their program and not necessarily that because they have to book me because I'm cool, which is, you know, that's kind of an attitude that a lot of musicians go by. I'm good. So you need to book me. And uh, like, especially if they do something as uh, popular as playing in a piano trio, you know, they're like, even if there are 10 different piano trio gigs in the same festival, 40 have applied so like you would never have a career <laughs> from playing that specific festival over and over again um what what is your approach to musicians what like if you meet musicians at, at a conference how do you see them um and what do you think about their communication skills um i really want to provide opportunities or to support it however I can those musicians who I feel are get that this is a business and have made a plan mm -hmm. and if a musician is independently at a music conference or a music industry event they've decided to invest in their career by attending those events I'm going to fall over myself to help <laughs> them either to build their network to promote what they're doing if i have opportunities for them to perform they're going to be much more likely to get through the door on that because if you demonstrate that you are committed and are building that uh that career in the right way it's a much easier thing to work with you because i know then that um i know that you are i'm able to have those conversations I'm able to rely on on the professionalism of you as an artist so I do think, and maybe I know you want to touch on this separately, but the European Music Business Task Force exactly identifies these things. Uh, the the task force itself. I was on the first one. There's now a second task force funded by the European Commission um, and administrated by the Music Cities Network, um, which is a fantastic network. And if you have political or governance links into a city that you're working with. I would highly recommend joining the Music Cities Network or persuading your city to invest in the Music Cities Network. Mm -hmm. But um, as part of the European Music Business Task Force, we started to look at how people cultivate sustainable careers across the European music industry. And some of these, there were some, there were a series of consistent trends that appeared in most people's careers. I've touched on one, which is the support of government and the state one way or another uh, another one would be putting yourself in the opportunity in the position where opportunity can opportunity can happen but related to your question around showcases and musicians presence there there are two elements to this one is about attending those international events and expanding your professional network and the second is that almost every person who has a sustainable professional music industry career at some point has has had someone else in the music industry uh give them a, a step up but that and, and, hard to do hard to achieve yeah it is it is and what and what that means is that unless you decide to put yourself in the position where you can build those networks yourself and find those those industry mentors then then it's going to be left to those people that were born into it, that already had those contacts, that already had those connections. And that keeps yeah. 
that keeps it quite narrow and quite divert uh, and quite um uh it means that everyone's the same when they are attending these kind of events. So if you are passionate about building your career in the music industry, attending industry events and growing your network is an essential way to do that because ultimately this is a people business. Um, so yeah. when an artist attends an industry event and they've done so because they think they've identified the relevant market for them and they've decided to invest in their career in that way, I can just only applaud them because they're doing exactly the right thing in exactly the right direction. And that's something that that myself and many other people in the music industry want to support and celebrate. Um, the more artists that do that, the stronger their careers and the stronger the sector will be. Yeah, I think just by showing up, you have already 96% more chance to succeed than yeah. anyone else. Yeah, it's out, um, you know, out, out of sight, out of mind, you know, and it, it's hard to think of it that way because the onus is always on musicians to do everything, which is really unfair, yeah. but it's nevertheless where things are. Um, so if you, uh, if you are trying to get yourself booked on a festival stage or selected for an artist, uh, for an agency roster, or, you, you know, you decided it's time now for you to grow your team. And that's a whole other thing that I know you talk about a, a lot, Nanny, and whether it's even appropriate to grow your team. But for some people, they reach the point where they do need to bring on that extra person to help them in whatever way that will be, whether that is their social media, their bookkeeping as a booking agent, as a manager, whoever is going to join their team. When you are, you can't, you don't get, you don't get to build your team without building your professional network first. And yes. That's where those social. That's where those showcase yeah. events come in, and it depends on the size of your pie, how much of that pie you can share. Exactly, exactly, and knowing what that means, you know, yeah. you, these are your team members. There isn't anybody who's going to care more about your music career than you. So that's the first lesson in my course. Oh, nobody is it cares about your music as much as you do? Exactly. So <laughs> you're the boss. You're the chief exec, and that means you exactly. might. If you do have, if you're lucky enough to have a manager, well, you're their boss, not the other way around. So exactly. you have to know the industry. This is exactly what I try to convey to other musicians. They think they have to be picked up by someone, but it's a much harder realization to understand that you are the boss. Mm -hmm. And I have this conversation sometimes with musicians that work with me because I, I work very carefully planned and everything is organized and I have contracts and then I would send them a contract and they would be like, why are you sending me a contract? Don't you trust me? And I'm like, I, it's not a matter of trust. I am your boss. And they're <laughs> like, you're being bossy. It's like, no, I'm not being bossy. I'm your employer. This is what I do. I am here to employ you. I'm going to take you on tour. I want to make sure that you're not going to drink or smoke backstage or not be late for a gig, that I will be able, that there will be consequences to do certain things. If you don't show up for three times, I can kick you out of the band. It's in the, it's in the contract. Wow. So this is not a, I mean, it is also a friendship, but it's mm -hmm. first and foremost, a business relationship. I love, I love that approach. Um, it's terrifying for many people, uh, but I love that approach because ultimately, when, with most people in their music careers, it starts organically and it starts socially. You might make music with your friends, and then before oh, you yeah. know, you're starting to value it. But as soon as you are, as soon as money gets introduced, then you have to formalize that relationship. You have to make sure that you understand you're now in a business, not just your mates with the uh, yes. with, with money sort of floating in and out. And you also have to make a distinction between being a solo artist and being a band. If you are a yeah. band, then you can be a democracy. But if you're a solo artist, it's not mm. a democracy anymore. Mm. Well, also, if you're a band, that means it works both ways. If you are a band and you need to have a, an, understanding, an understanding of who owns what, how that division of labor works out, what happens yeah. if one of your band members does something that brings the rest of your band into disrepute? So exactly. I, I, I'd like to talk to bands about things like how you're going to set yourself up as a company. You're effectively mm -hmm. partners, you're directors of your business, whether that is a, a shareholder mm -hmm. business where you each take percentages or whether that is a company limited by guarantee mm -hmm. where you have agreed roles and agreed remuneration. Yeah. Once you are going down that route, how that responsibility is shared out and how the finances are shared out for the workload that you deliver 
is something yeah. you've got to be open about right from the start. What's your liability? Who is the rights owner? That's yeah. very important. Like if somebody does something that puts your band at risk, you need to be prepared for that. I had a tour with a musician that I, I bought uh, like two extra luggage bags for his music instruments that he was bringing on tour. But he decided, oh, I'm, I'm, go I'm not going to buy an extra, because he wanted to also go travel. He decided I'm not going to buy an extra um, uh, luggage for my backpack, for my mochila that I want to take with me also when I'm traveling, not only the touring bags. So I'm just going to tie both instruments together and hand them in as one luggage. And then I'm just going to use the other luggage for my other stuff. And of course, the way that he tied the, the instruments together was not good and they both broke. And when, of course, he arrived on tour without instruments and then also tried to charge me for whatever costs to repair the instruments. If we wouldn't have had a, a liability uh, clause in our contract in advance, I could have gotten into trouble. Mm. Gosh, that, so, is a, that is a very yeah. practical real world example of the importance yeah. of treating this as a business, as an industry. Yeah. What would you do? Like, how can you replace a five thousand dollar instrument? Yeah. Well, and also that only paid you one and a half thousand. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah. social socially, I I play music informally, not as part of my career, but as a kind of informal thing. And the instruments that I have, you know, I might have paid so much for them, but actually, they genuinely are priceless. Uh, and yes. I'm sure for many musicians, they feel the same. If you lose them or they're broken, you're not you can't just buy another. How would you disregard your instrument that way? Yeah. 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 Uh, I know. I know. We, we're we're a bit tight for time. Uh, with, yeah, with, I have a lot of else? questions to ask you, but maybe I'll just sum up with one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last night of Budapest Ritmo, uh, we were just about to go back to the hotel, and everybody was tired. We already had a lot of drinks. We talked ourselves out, and then we and then somebody says, "Okay, let's go to a bar." And 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 everybody was like, "Yeah, no, let's go to the hotel." And you came up with. FOMO, and you told me I, I have a fear of missing out because I always want to be there when everything happens. And I think that's very interesting, especially in the music industry. A lot of people don't know which gigs to say yes or no to, uh, which opportunities to recognize as important. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit about your relationship with FOMO. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. we, we run an artist mentoring program and uh, uh, and one of the bits of advice, there's a moment where we hand over from one outgoing cohort to the incoming cohort. And every year without fail, the outgoing cohort said, look, don't feel you have to absolutely go for it, stay up until the middle of the night and, uh, you know, uh, party really hard. The, the, the likelihood is at the moment that probably Tom will be around doing those things, but the, but it's not big, <laughs> it's not clever, and you don't have to do that. Um, and I think, again, it goes back to knowing yourself and knowing where your limits are and knowing your boundaries. I, I'm, I've learned, I'm, I'm, I always try my very best to make sure that I am still at work. And even if I'm out till very, very late, no, I'm not going to be in a situation where the next morning I'm not able to do uh to not able to function professionally and to have those kind of conversations. Yeah. But I've built those relationships socially in a strong way and they lead to opportunities that you can never quite map out at that moment. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a balance, but you have to know yourself, you have to know your own limits and you have to know at what point to, to duck out. And that's totally okay to do that. And it doesn't help that people like me are often still there and there might be the first one there in the morning that's because i absolutely love my job and i'm excited by every bit of it and i cannot wait to leap out of bed and go and support musicians and their teams every day um and that mean that extends to not wanting to miss out at night at uh, conferences and events and, and and things like that i don't want to miss any artists i don't want to miss any exciting conversations because uh, i think i'm very very fortunate to have this as a career um and and hopefully the conversations I have in late night in bars might lead to opportunities where artists can benefit that we're working from, whether that is new reciprocal touring networks, whether that is showcasing opportunities, whether that is conversations like this one, which hopefully 
anybody watching might think, oh yeah, there's a nugget there that I might take, or oh my goodness, I don't want to do folk music in England, or whatever they're thinking about. But you know, those com this conversation has led from one of those informal moments and in a professional event. Yeah, I mean, like I think there's a bit of nuggets here of wisdom. <laughs> Ken Bora, I really had fun talking to you. Thank you so much for Me being too. a guest on Music Career Radio. Thanks, Nanny. Nice to speak to you. Yeah, come again. Let, 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 I'll let you convince me to do this again. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, check him out, Tom Bassford. Uh, so I have so many accolades. I don't know which one I should mention. The English Folk Expo, Manchester Folk Festival, European Music Business Tax, uh, task force, the, f the official folk albums charts, um, the steering group of Manchester City. I mean, there's so many things. Just check him out. He's your guy. And uh, walk the talk. Just uh, be like Tom. <laughs> hey. Hey, thanks, mate. Yes. Thank All you right. so much. Cheers, then. Cheers. So that has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being a part of Music Career Radio again. Um, I've been exciting. It's been exciting for me to do this again. I haven't done it in a while. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to help uh, maintain this podcast and make it go further, please uh, visit our website, ydiymusic dot com slash donate and make any contribution it will be great um you could also send a paypal transfer to paypal.me slash noam vazana and if you want me to continue to run this podcast please let me know in the comments uh let me know why also because uh, i'd need a little bit of convincing but i like it so i might just do it again and you can always uh, watch our past episodes on ydiymusic.com slash radio in the meantime good luck Keep calm and DIY.